The US Department of Defense is the neoconservative stronghold. Paul Wolfowitz, the number two there, and fellow neocon Douglas Fife, the number three. At the more dovish State Department, neocon John Bolton is in charge of arms control. At the National Security Council, there's Elliot Abrams, the president's Near East advisor. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and Vice President Dick Cheney are not neocon intellectuals, perhaps, but certainly political allies. That Sunday, a meeting of the pro-Israel lobby, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Syria also now faces a critical choice. Even Secretary of State Colin Powell, who's quietly opposed much of the neocon agenda, is starting to use neocon language. Syria bears the responsibility for its choices and for the consequences. The real symbol of, of opposition, so to speak, is Secretary of State Powell. So if Secretary of State Powell goes, that'll be game, set, and match for the neoconservatives? Uh, well, I would say game, set, and match would be to win him over to our side. According to an Iraqi general, 4,000 people have volunteered from 23 uh, countries have volunteered to participate in suicide attacks. And that More worries on the breakfast news. Dog days for the neocons, though they seem unperturbed. We're talking, I think, on day 12 of the war, something like that. And, uh, you know, it would be instructive, I think, to go back to day 12 of the first Gulf War, day 12 of Kosovo, day 12 of Afghanistan, and see, how f see both how far along people were and the extent to which people were always, people, people in the press, at any rate, were already reaching for quagmire and debacle and disaster and, and all the rest. Professor Cohen's old pal and college dean was Paul Wolfowitz. The Deputy Defense Secretary is the man who brought neocon philosophy into the heart of the U.S. administration, a philosophy of exporting democracy in the interests of defending America. What is distinctive about his worldview which has been influential, is that it is, it's a very interesting blending of, in some ways, rather old-fashioned realpolitik, if you will, a tough-minded view of the world, with, on the other hand, a certain kind of American democratic idealism. That's very unusual. That's really very unusual. And, and that, that's the, that synthesis, at the moment, I think, is, is intellectually dominant. I have no idea whether it will survive this war or not. Now, with a panel of world-class military and political experts and scholars, here's Chris Core And very familiar voices and faces at the microphones tonight. Harlan of course, some neocons, like Michael Ledeen, but even exporting democracy rather more aggressively than others. I'm just the moderator. Thank you for joining us. I'll ask it this way of you, Michael, that, you know, how many of these, you better watch it, we're coming after you, can we do at once? We're going to have to bring down a series of regimes who are the sponsors of a network of various terrorist organizations. And Iraq is part of it. It was Elliot Cohen who gave this neocon campaign a name. He sees the Cold War against communism as World War III and the conflict with what he calls militant Islam as World War IV. And so I said World War IV somewhat tongue-in-cheek but it, as a way of capturing the fact that, uh, I mean, I believe we are locked in a long-term war with the radicalized branches of Islam, which are deeply hostile to the United States, but I think more broadly to the West. You have a very large phenomenon, which is very difficult to figure out how to, um, how to beat. Um, which, it, which, it, which, which, which is capable, really, of inflicting catastrophic damage, not just to our cities, but to yours. As the coalition approaches Baghdad, George Bush's White House has kept faith with the hardline neocons. But what do the rest of America's conservative movement make of them? Um, I was asked this morning to give an update on the uh, support of the troops rallies around the United States. To find out, we got an invite to one of the mainstream conservative rights' private weekly meetings. Here, conservative lobbyists from across the U.S. plot the week's business. To liaise with them, there's a man from the White House. Effects. Is somebody voting against us because they're a union member, or are they voting against us because they're a government employee? Many traditional conservatives are suspicious of the neocon cuckoos in their nest. 
They don't like America being embroiled in foreign adventures. And then there's the Middle East problem. They are entitled to their opinions, but when it gets to Arab bashing, general Arab bashing, I think they take it too far. I think they're a disaster for this country. And many members of Congress believe that, but they don't dare say it. And they'll take on everyone. It's like a gang. You know, it's like mafia. But are you a mafia? <laughs> that, that is so uh, absurd. Mafia? Do you recognize any, um, no, any gang, mafia, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, it, it, I, I'm, I usually have a response to statements like that, but I don't understand the statement, frankly. Uh, I don't know what power to intimidate where it's suggested that we have. Media? We, we, on the media? We, we say what we think. We're the very opposite of the kind of clandestineness one associates with the mafia. I think what rubs people wrong about us is that we're so out front and audacious about saying things that, are, that, that go against the grain. Some of Washington's right-wing insiders are so irritated with their neocon colleagues, they like to dispute whether the White House is really influenced by them at all. Some intellectuals have run around saying, and let's have a war with, and they've listed 11 countries, okay? Um, and because in the 11 was included Iraq, they've also gone around going, because the cock crowed, the sun went up. As opposed to taking a look and saying, this government and this president, we're going to hit Iraq, we're going to hit the Taliban, regardless of what some people wrote in newspaper columns. If, now, if I'm wrong, and the United States government invades Iran and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and decides to run a 30-year holy war uh, against the Muslim and Arab world, uh, then seven uh, writers did in fact pull the president around by the nose. We don't claim credit for it at all. Um, you could say that our power is a figment of our enemy's imagination. It might be absolutely true. Uh, we are not claiming to be running the world. Uh, our job is just to think. And if our ideas get adopted, and if our ideas turn into policy, wonderful. That's what we're here for. Good morning. As always, it's great to have you here. Coalition forces have the Baghdad skyline in their sights. The U.S. Central Command says that... Suddenly, optimism on every channel, and the neocons ramping up the rhetoric. We will make a lot of people very nervous. And we will hear, for example, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, or the Saudi royal family, thinking about this idea that these Americans are spreading of democracy in this part of the world, they will say, you make us very nervous. And our response should be good. Going too far? No. Uh, the Iranians and the Syrians uh, are even more nervous than the um, Saudis and Egyptians at this very moment. Um, Syria is making, you know, and the you know, Syrian regime is making comments that they're nervous, that they think that they're next. So, are the Syrians worried? I went to their embassy to ask whether they took much notice of the neoconservatives. Do they go to those American Enterprise Institute briefings? Oh, yes, I try to attend almost all their public meetings. Sometimes I, 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 I find them amusing. Sometimes they are really terrifying in the way they think, the way they would like to shape the world, the way they think they can impose their doctrine and their ideology on everybody else, even if force is needed. You worried? No, we are not worried at all. We have our alliances, we have our friends, but I don't think they have any chance whatsoever of uh, translating this agenda into policies. 